from the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal. This is Free Expression with Jerry Baker. Hello and welcome to Free Expression with me, Jerry Baker, from the Wall Street Journal editorial page. Thanks very much for joining us. If you're not already a subscriber, please do subscribe whenever you get your podcasts. This week, are we all going to be killed by computers? Yes, that used to be the stuff of science fiction thrillers, but to some serious-minded people, that is now the risk we face as the capabilities of artificial intelligence expand at a phenomenal pace. AI is, loosely speaking, defined as intelligence demonstrated by machines. That can include everything from voice and facial recognition to large learning models in which computers can at least appear to use intelligent reasoning and develop cognitive and communication capabilities. AI has been around for decades. In the last few months, the debate about its capacities and indeed the ethics of it, have intensified with the arrival of new products that have taken it way beyond what was previously known. First, ChatGPT, the chat bot by OpenAI from Microsoft, and then Google's Bard have demonstrated their smarts at everything from writing high-quality student essays to answering wide-ranging questions about science, philosophy, life, and everything, and even doing plausible imitations of columns written by newspaper journalists, God help us, All of those have combined to really emphasize the capabilities of AI. But this, of course, is just the start. These likely capacities will go way beyond that, and they're expanding by the day. As the frontiers of data and the speed at which these technologies operate increase, the potential now seems limitless, and for many people, perilous. Is it really possible that we could have a computer that's more intelligent than humans and that's therefore no longer controllable by humans? Could it really destroy us? Some scientists do fear this. Elisa Yudkowsky, co-founder of the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, warned last month in an essay in Time magazine, and I quote, that someday the creation of a really powerful AI would result in every single member of the human species and all biological life dying shortly thereafter. He was writing in response to an open letter from a significant number of prominent scientists and technologists calling for a pause in the current AI development of the kind of times we've been seeing because of particular risks that this development may pose to society and things like making misinformation even more plausible than it already is. One of those who signed the letter was Joshua Bengio. He's a leading computer scientist noted for his work on artificial neural networks and deep learning. He's a professor at the Université de Montréal. In 2018, he received the Turing Award which is one of the most prestigious honors in the computing field for his work with another scientist on deep learning. And Joshua Bengio joins me now. Joshua Bengio, thanks very much for joining Free Expression. My pleasure. Everybody's talking about AI, which obviously moved center stage with the development of these new chatbots, but it's been around for a long time. There's great concern now about its capabilities, and some people even think that it could actually, to quote somebody, destroy all human life when it's powerful enough. Is it that much of a threat? Well, not in its current form or anything close to it. But I think it's important to think about those possibilities and have research to uh, prepare ourselves because we've reached quite uh, an important milestone with these AI systems. They now pass what is called the Turing test, meaning if you have conversation with them, it's very hard to know if you are interacting with human or with a machine. If you would just give us a very simple layman's explanation of, of how AI or AGI, I know artificial general intelligence, how it works. And again, what stage we've reached here, as you describe it there in the Turing test, what that means, how AI has developed, the stage of development that we've now reached. Well, so first of all, there is no AGI. There is potentially in the future human level AI. Why do you yes. say there's no AGI? Because that is something that people are talking about. That is something potentially in the future, is it? Is that the idea? No, it does not exist. Even humans are not general purpose, completely general purpose. Right. I mean, people use this term uh, wrongly. It was initially meant to mean a completely general AI system. And now people use it to mean at the level of human intelligence, but there's another term that's more appropriate, which is human level AI. In any case, that's just a kind of debate between experts. The point is we're not there. However, we've reached a point where machines can make sense of what we say and write in language and respond to us and you know have interactions and that means they can potentially be used to hack our communications our social media our emails and uh, we wouldn't know that we are interacting with machines the fabric of our society is based on language this is how we're all connected to each other If machines can pass for humans and that can be replicated at huge 
scales, then what we've seen with disinformation, with trolls and so on, is nothing and could be much worse and destabilizing for our democracies and, and even for authoritarian governments. So there's enough concern here for us to accelerate the regulation process, which is slowly, but much too slowly going on in various countries. But again, if you would, just in pretty simple layman's terms, explain how it works and, if you like, what the trajectory of AI has been. Because I think of the expansion of data, the speed at which it works, the sophistication of the algorithms, does look as though the kind of progress that's being made, and we're seeing it in, obviously, in public terms, in things like chat GPT and BARD, but it does look like the progress that's been made is accelerating rapidly. Just explain, if you would, in the simplest possible terms for a lay audience, how that works and why it's advancing at the pace that it seems to be. So the way these systems work is that they learn from data, they learn from examples. This is different from some of the older versions of AI systems from the 90s and 80s and earlier, where we essentially programmed knowledge directly into the computer. So we knew exactly what we were putting into the machine. But now these systems, they discover their own knowledge in a way that's not in a form that humans can easily uh, kind of analyze. Instead, they're more like our brains. In other words, they have huge quantities of parameters that are going to be gradually tuned to be consistent with the data that they're trained on. And so these AI systems in particular, like ChatGPT, are trained on a large fraction of everything that can be available on the internet in terms of texts. That's many orders of magnitude bigger than any human could potentially read in their lifetime. And they learn to imitate that text. In other words, they learn to respond like humans would. And that explains a lot of the quirks, like people interacting with the systems and having the impression that there's a person there with emotions and so on, and even a consciousness. But of course, that's an illusion. Right. And that's something else I want to get onto, the idea of emotions and sentience, and to what extent that we could have sentient machines. But we're seeing these applications of AI all the time now. And for all of the fears that are being understandably talked about, we're seeing some tremendous progress in terms of human benefits, I mean, just just last week, I think there was a story, for example, which I, which caught my eye about how artificial intelligence can read CT scans of lung cancer patients and can identify patterns that can be the very, very early stages of lung cancer, for example, way, way sooner than the human eye, even the finest medical minds can do. There are extraordinary beneficial potential here, isn't there, in all kinds of ways? Absolutely. I mean, that's one of the main reasons why I've been working on AI for many decades, and also because I wanted to understand intelligence. So what the letter proposed was not to stop AI research. People have really not carefully looked at what was written. It proposed slowing down for these very large systems that are even larger than the largest ones that exist right now. But there's a lot of really useful AI applications in healthcare, as you mentioned, the environment, fighting climate change. And we want to continue that. In fact, we want to accelerate those applications. For the most part, there is no danger from these applications. We mostly can see benefits in applying, applying AI to education or to saving lives and helping us deal with future pandemics or other things like this. So we should definitely continue on those paths. Yeah. So again, many benefits. You've been researching these and we're, we're seeing them all the time. You know, again, we've seen the most simple terms, whether it's things like face recognition or self-driving cars. There are all kinds of forms of artificial intelligence and with all of the benefits that those have. But again, so explain to us, if you would, what is the risk? Because you say we're not there yet. You said we're not close to being in a situation where machines can sort of somehow take over the world. But what is the potential there? Is it really imaginable that a machine could be able to develop a form of reasoning or indeed a form of intentionality, let's say, that could result in you know, widespread consequences way beyond what anyone inputting data into that machine or processing that machine in some way would intend themselves? Is there a capability in those machines way beyond the capacity of the people who are actually controlling them? In some sense, that's already the case. Right? We, we have machines that can play much better than the strongest humans at games like chess and go. And the amount of knowledge that even like GPT-4 has is probably at least verbalizable knowledge, uh, much greater than any person. Now, how deeply they understand 
And whether they actually reason or to what extent they do, I think they do, but in a very weak way. I think, for example, in terms of reasoning, these systems are not even as strong as a child. That being said, I'm not at all concerned about the current systems. I'm concerned that the potentially more dangerous systems that have goals, that have intentions, that could be designed in coming years, could have consequences that are hard to fathom right now. And I believe that the best thing we can do for the moment is to accelerate the regulation and the auditing and the monitoring and the sort of level of ethics awareness among the organizations that build those systems. And that means governments need to step in. So, yeah. I do really want to come on to the questions you raised, particularly, and you were one of the co-signatories of that letter. But I just quickly want to try just again to get my own head around this in terms of the capabilities of AI. And let me put it this way, if I may. Are there intrinsic differences between human intelligence and machine intelligence? Or, or in a sense, is the brain just an incredibly sophisticated machine, maybe several years or decades ahead of where the, the most advanced AI has got? Is the brain simply a massive repository of data and collection of neural pathways that's able to sift that data and interpret that data and manipulate it in much the way the machines can? Or is there something fundamentally and intrinsically different about the human brain? Or is it just at a, a more advanced level of development than what artificial intelligence can do? Well, nobody knows for sure the answer to your question, but everything we know from biology points to your second answer. In other words, the brain is a very complicated machine and it's one that we don't fully understand, and it might take you know several more decades before we do. We do understand a lot of the principles about how the brain works. And so because the brain is a very big machine, there's no reason to think that in the future we will not be able to build machines with comparable abilities. Now, I think the question then becomes, well... Do we actually want to do that? And it's not a black and white question. Maybe we want some kinds of AIs that could be incredibly useful to us. And maybe there are some kinds of AIs that some designs, if you want, that could be more dangerous, that we would have less control over. And we would like to regulate those away, just like we have done for many other things. Like, think about human cloning, right? We've decided that this was a slippery slope and that we wouldn't do it. And it has to be at the international level, just like human cloning, that the countries doing these kinds of research agree together that there is a danger for everyone to go in, in some directions and we need to put the right guardrails. If, as you say, that the brain is just essentially an incredibly sophisticated machine and it is easily conceivable that one day we will have artificial machines that have that are comparable in capacity to the human brain, does that not also imply that we will have machines that are one day superior in capacity to the human brain? And then doesn't that take us into, forgive me if I've got the terminology wrong here, but what some people call the sort of the notion of the singularity, that once you start having machines that are more advanced in their capacities than the human brain, then essentially you jump to a kind of new level of development of intelligence where we are obviously no longer in any way in control and these machines that are smarter than us will ultimately control us. Again, is that science fiction or is that actually a, a kind of increasingly looming reality? It's clearly not a looming reality. And it's not even a concept that the AI community accepts of, uh, in general. This super exponential, like very rapid growth that goes forever as soon as you pass human intelligence doesn't make sense to me. However, it does make sense that if we have machines that are smarter than us, they don't need to be exponentially smarter than us. They could also, well, first be used by humans in nefarious ways, and second, potentially do things that we didn't anticipate, and that could be bad for us. So, yeah, I don't like the concept of singularity. In general, when we look far into the future, there's a sort of a, a veil of mystery because we can't predict things that are too far from us or that too, too different from our current state. We don't have the means to make those predictions. But it's just like climate change. So think about tipping points if, of the climate. Our current models are not very good at predicting the bad things that could happen, you know, if some cascade of events turned out really bad for the planet. We can sort of conceptualize this, but it's hard to make quantitative predictions about these, although people try. And in the case of AI, 
is similar. Like we can sort of conceptualize that some things could go wrong, but it's hard to have a very good handle on that. On the other hand, I think what we have to do is to think of, well, how do we better coordinate among humans so that we kind of check each other so as to minimize potential damage and make sure that we keep track of the progress to avoid anything that would hurt and harm humans, including current AI systems that are already doing harm, for example, in terms of biases and discrimination. So how would a pause work then? The pause that you've called for, how, as you say, it would have to be international, it would have to be kind of pretty well universal agreement, otherwise somebody somewhere in a in a laboratory somewhere is going to be sort of steaming ahead, presumably. How in practice would this work? Well, I don't really believe that those companies will do what we suggested, but they might. And they might... Explain what you suggested was, if you would, please. The practicalities of what you suggested. They slow down on the development of systems even larger than the largest one that we have now for six months. And really, this was not meant to be the ultimate solution, right? Only the beginning of a conversation where as soon as we can, governments step in. And then as soon as we can, there is international coordination. And you're right, there's always going to be some exceptions. But this is true of many other things that we, you know, other risks that we have to deal with. Think about, you know, nuclear war. Think about biological warfare. Think about chemical warfare. So, yes, there are risks. and We can't probably completely guarantee that we will avoid them. But what we can do is minimize them. And so that's the moral thing to do. If we think there are ways to reduce risks that could be bad for people, we have to act in those directions, even if it's not the perfect solution. The analogy with nuclear war, which a lot of people, or nuclear weapon capability, which a lot of people use, is a good one because there have been treaties, there have been international treaties that stop the the further development of nuclear weapons. But perhaps maybe arguably the lesson of nuclear weapons is that one country had nuclear weapons, that was in 1945 in the United States, and used them. So there's always going to be an advantage for someone, whether it be a commercial organization seeking commercial advantage or a state seeking geopolitical advantage, to actually cheat, if you like, or to avoid agreeing to these terms. Again, I'm just wondering how practical the idea of a kind of a moratorium, a pause or whatever really is, given the kind of advances we're seeing and given the kind of advantages, again, both economic and security and all kinds of other advantages that accrue to someone rapidly moving ahead with AI development. I will answer the same thing as I did before. In other words, if you have a better idea, I'm all ears. (laughs) What we have to do is think through our options, discuss those options, and move ahead with the one that seems the best, even though it doesn't guarantee us that it's going to work. And the worst thing we could do is say, oh, it's never going to work. We can't do anything. So let's just let go. That's the most dangerous option. We've got to take a short break there. But when we come back, I'll have more on the future of AI. Is it really a threat to all of us? With Joshua Bengio. Stay with us. You're listening to Free Expression with Jerry Baker. Don't forget, you can listen to the latest episode anytime on your smart speaker. Just say, play the Opinion Free Expression podcast. Now, back to Jerry Baker. I'm back and I'm talking with Joshua Bengio, an expert on AI and machine learning, about the perils these new technologies may pose. You have, with things like cloning is perhaps a very good example, right? There have been international agreements to restrict cloning, although one suspects that maybe, again, in some laboratory somewhere, someone is doing that. But some people have called for an outright haul. Again, a very prominent article, which got a lot of attention a couple of weeks ago by uh, Lizzie Yadkowski, saying, again, pointing to these threats that AI poses and actually saying a pause isn't really going to cut it, that we need an outright halt, I'm guessing, again. Well, that would be throwing the baby with the bathwater, because there are many different kinds of AI systems. And until recently, none of these were even kind of very dangerous. I mean, they're like misuses of the current AI systems that, as I mentioned, but what prompted me to sign this letter is mostly that we now have this fairly short-term danger, which is not super intelligent, which is misinformation at a large scale. And that's where the conversation should be, because this is something that's, it's not some hypothetical thing. It's something that we can take. I can easily imagine technically taking the current technology and applying it to these users that could throw our democracies on its knees. People 
don't even agree on basic things that are needed in order to have a democracy, like the results of elections. So it could get much worse. But one of the practical or, if you like, almost political difficulties there is that, you know, you, you say you're absolutely, I mean, obviously people are very concerned about the ability of AI to produce a highly plausible, if you like, misinformation. But I think one of the things that concerns people, perhaps especially on one particular side of the spectrum, is that we saw with these, you know, for example, ChatGPT, when it sort of went public at the end of last year, and it's received a lot of attention in the last few months, ChatGPT obviously did seem to have inbuilt political biases itself. You know, you can do simple exercises like, you know, ask ChatGPT to know name any good things that kind of a right-wing government has done and it doesn't come up with any, but you can ask it to name things that a left-wing government has done and it comes up with So I'm just wondering, again, this is not a question about the feasibility in terms of international agreements of a pause, but whether you can even agree, whether it's even possible to agree right now, what is any sort of kind of objective development of AI that we've actually achieved that is, you know, that produces practical results for people that users would find acceptable. Until we presumably at least develop these capabilities in ways that actually are more widely accepted, it's going to look like people are just sort of trying to halt the development of this uh, technology in a way that can simply entrenches the kind of current ideological or political views of those who have most power and control over it. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't agree with your statement. I do think that it is possible in the foreseeable future to build AI systems that are trained not to imitate how humans respond, which explains a lot of they're sometimes, you know, taking political positions, but instead to learn to be as truthful as possible. So mathematically, this is something we have a handle on and that the current AI technology could be used for. We're not there yet. I'm trying to say that research could focus on AI systems that are by construction as unbiased as one can be and as truthful to everything that they have observed as possible. Again, I don't want to get too deep into the political argument here, but how is that possible? I mean, is it possible to develop an AI that comes up with an objective answer to the question, what's a better system of government, socialism or capitalism? I know I'm being very crude and simplistic there, but I'm trying to get at the problems with, what, I suppose, of what objective truth really is. There is objective truth. That's what science is about. And a big problem today is that we kind of forgetting that there is objective truth. Now, Something that's also very important and that's central to what science is about is to start with humility and saying, even though there is objective truth, we don't know it. A big problem with the way that we're debating is people are convinced that they hold the truth. So if we all had a scientific attitude towards reality that says, well, we're not sure, but here's some arguments and let's try to reason with that, what's best collectively whether it's about our political system or some treatment for a disease, we could apply the same sort of rigor. But it's not what's going on right now. And it's mostly about the weaknesses of the human mind that, you know, we have biases, we are easily influential, we have egos that prevent us from being actually rational and all kinds of issues like this. Yeah, this is a good note to end on, and this is not a flippant question, it's a genuine question. So is, is it conceivable that AI could become, in an age of, as you say, when we uh, people talk about we live in a post-truth society, when, where everybody, you know, I have my truth, you have your truth, is it conceivable that somehow some artificial intelligence could be developed which could sort of somehow be the ultimate arbiter of these critical questions because it will be more capable of getting to the objective truth than any as you say, kind of mentally or morally deficient human brain might be. Able to say. <laughs> it would be nice, no? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, would it? <laughs> no, but uh, no, I, yeah, think, I think it? it's a reasonable objective. And uh, yeah. we should strive towards systems that are trustworthy, you know, whatever your beliefs are, so long as you're willing to be rational. It's a very interesting idea, I must say, Professor. The idea that AI, rather than killing us all, is maybe going to govern us all one day. So that's an interesting idea. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Joshua Benji. A really interesting discussion. Thank you very much for taking the time to join Free Expression. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Well, that's it for this week's episode of Free Expression. Thanks very much for joining us. I'll be back next week with another deep exploration of one of the big issues facing our world. Thanks again for joining us. See you next week. <laughs>